And I want to look now in a little bit more detail at the best known early controversy in Islamic theology, um, which manifests very clearly this key distinction. And this controversy uh, ranged believers in free will, on the one hand, those who upheld God's moral nature against determinists. People who believed everything is, is predetermined in order to preserve the stress on God's more metaphysical qualities, the divine omnipotence and so forth. What does the Quran itself have to say as a basis for this discussion? Well, the Quran says that God is powerful over all things. He is preeminently an omnipotent deity. He has a qudra, the divine power, which is constantly, incessantly manifested in every movement, every stillness, every event in the created world. Uh, and this Qudra is so powerful that it seems at first sight to overwhelm any contingent potency or power that individual people might think they have. So we find the Quran saying, God created you and created what you do. Seemingly quite a determinist statement. The problem for the early Muslims as they tried to frame a theology was that God also has to be morally consistent. So we find in Surah 4 verse 49, God shall not wrong a man so much as the weight of the hair on a date stone. And in Surah 45 verse 22, God created the heavens and the earth with the truth so that each soul might be recompensed according to what it has earned with no one wronged. So the first great doctrinal problem in Islam, and really the most recurrent one in our theology, involves the evident tension between these two rival, almost, registers of the divine perfection. The Quran juxtaposes them. But how can God be just when he rewards or punishes human actions, which he himself, through his qudra, has known were going to happen, has actually determined anyway? Um, so in Surah 2, verse 7, we read, concerning those who willfully deny the truth, God has sealed up their hearts, and a heavy covering lies over their eyes and their ears. Now, if God himself has sealed up their hearts, how can he punish them in consequence when they sin? Well, this apparent contradiction is, of course, simply the Islamic form of the most taxing difficulty which besets any theistic religion. Judaism and Christianity famously experienced their own disputes here, um, with the libertarians, um, those who emphasized human free will, particularly in, in Judaism, generally getting the better of the argument. In Christianity, the determinist position um, lingers on today in some churches with a strong Calvinistic influence. Um, some of the Scottish churches, for instance, influenced by, by Knox, do very much believe in a form of predestination. And the coherence of predestinarian ideas is still at least tacitly recognized by, by many others. In Islam, both positions seem to be vindicated by the revelation itself. God is perfect both morally and metaphysically. First believers accepted this on trust and were content to leave the paradox unexplained. However, as the early Muslims started to debate with the uh, philosophically much more sophisticated at that time, uh, Christians, particularly in places like Damascus, this simply led to embarrassment. The apparent tension couldn't be explained. And the two rival positions, uh, voluntaristic and uh, deterministic, soon became identifiable dogmatic tendencies within the early community of believers. So some people felt themselves inclined to belief in free will, others um, were more interested in deterministic ideas. And the hardest line of all of the determinists were people called Mujbira. These were absolute determinists. They said, everything you do has actually been decided upon, not by you, that's just an illusion, but by God himself. Um, these people seem to have been supported by the um, ever cynical Umayyad regime in Damascus for the simple reason that it was politically useful. If people thought that everything in the world was determined by God anyway, then they would be less inclined to challenge the corruption of, of the regime. So it had political um, backing. Opposed to the Mujbira, you find uh, believers in free will, and these people are called Mu'tazilites. 
Now these distinctions, believe it or not, continue to endure because um, Shia Islam, which accounts for maybe 10% of the world's Muslim, is still, for the most part, get rid of that, um, strongly influenced by later Mu'tazilite thinking. And a later scholar describes the view of the Mu'tazilite as follows. Man is the creator of his deeds, good or bad, and hence is deserving of reward or punishment in the afterlife for whatever he does. The Mujmara didn't agree with this because they thought it somehow suggests that there's a plurality of creators in the world, hence it's a polytheistic doctrine. Um, let me try, at the risk of perhaps losing you, uh, to go into this very interesting debate in, in a little bit more depth. I'll be skating very superficially over some of the other controversies in Islamic theology, but this I think we can use as a case study. Um, the Mu'tazilites shared with all of the people of Kalam, those who liked um, systematic theology, a belief in atoms. They thought that there is such a thing as the smallest possible particle in the world, and that was the basis of their cosmology. Now, their opponents held that the motions of atoms were not related causally. What does that mean? Well, the Asharites thought that there is no natural causality in the world, which is an apparently rather dramatic and seemingly unscientific attitude, which says, for instance, that if I throw uh, a football at the window, um, normally you'd expect the window to break, but that's not because the football is making the window break, that's because God is, is affecting the window directly and causing it to break. And they thought that if you affirmed any secondary causes in creation, you were thereby limiting the omnipotence of God. And this continues to be the, the mainstream Islamic view. And it's the one that's associated with the third great tendency in classical Islamic theology, one that still predominates and is regarded as the orthodoxy, the Ash'arites. Ash'arites named after the great early theologian Abu al-Hasan al-Ash'ari. And what the Ash'arites thought was there is no natural causality. Um, causality in the world is simply an illusion. They developed a system which modern philosophers would refer to as occasionalism, which has sometimes popped up in Western thought. Um, Malebranche is the most obvious uh, European exponent of an occasionalistic theory. They said that atoms do not have a duration. An atom is created instantaneously in time and vanishes instantaneously. And hence you cannot say that there is any kind of natural causality in the world. You can say that Act A may give rise predictably to Act B, but that is only because God's actions in the world are consistent. You can assume, if you chuck your football at the window, that God will cause the window to break because that's the way he operates. But you must not say that it's the football that's doing it. That, that is perceived as infringing on the divine omnipotence. Now, this view is an interesting example of how a classical Islamic thesis can actually be sustained in the modern world. And there was actually, at the moment, a great revival of Asharite theology, particularly in places like Turkey. The most lively Muslim theology at the moment is actually taking place in, in, in Turkey. Because in the 19th century, when there was a very mechanistic view of the universe, people thought this was simply absurd. They knew what atoms were, they could measure them, they could show them up in their equations, and Asherism simply seemed to be wrong. Atoms did have a duration. Mu'tazilites looked as if they were right. And in the early 20th century, partly for this reason, there was a kind of revival of Mu'tazili thought in Islam. More recently, however, with the, the new physics, physics is always calling itself new, but with, with the new generation of physicists, um, for instance, in Cambridge, we have somebody called Stephen Hawking, who's produced this famous book, um, uh, The Brief History of Time. What Hawking is saying is that you cannot, in fact, speak of the duration of atoms. In fact, you can't even speak coherently of the existence of any subatomic particles. You can see them as particles, you can see them as waves, you can see them as instantaneous, instances of a universal phenomenon that actually uh, encompasses the entire universe. It's, I'm not going to try and summarize his argument. 
um, in a few sentences. But the, the point is that astroism is now regarded as more cosmologically coherent than it used to be because of this notion of occasionalism. We don't need to look at this in detail, um, but the conclusion is Asherism has always denied um, real causality. Now, the reason why the Asherites were interested in this is that the Mu'tazilites, following the opposite position, thought that this kind of metaphysical speculation simply is beside the point. The most important point is that God has to remain the author of a coherent religion, and he has to be morally coherent in genuinely punishing or rewarding human beings for what they do. And this can only make sense if the relationship between human act and moral consequence is grounded in predictable and real moral uh, causal laws. So the Mu'tazilites hold atoms do have a duration. They're not recreated in each instant by God. And they said, if we accept this, then automatically we have to accept that we can speak meaningfully of the generation of acts. They call this tawallud, generation of acts by human beings. God's acts in the world are direct, mubashir, human acts are generated through this tawallud. And there are divisions amongst the Mu'tazilites over what this could, could mean. 